floor is yours, Thad Miller. Thank you, Ira. Uh, thank you. Um, before we get rolling, do you see what I see, which should be a slide? Not yet. Oh, okay. Hold on. Sorry. Share my entire screen. Okay. Here we go. How about now? It's just coming up now. Okay. There you go. Great. Excellent. Well, thanks for the, the uh, gracious introduction, Ira. Um, and thank you for having me to this webinar. Um, seems like a great group and I'm, you know, I'm really happy to, you know, hopefully get engaged uh, with this group beyond uh, today. Um, because sustainability, as you will see, is near and dear to my heart as well. Um, and so Ira asked me to, to talk a bit about uh, some of my work over the past, uh, oh, I'm probably like 10 years um, on sustainability science. Um, and and so I'll, I'll, I'll go through a little bit of, of where uh, the impetus for this work uh, came, because uh, I always find it's nice to sort of personally reflect on why you ended up you know, doing the work that you do to, to begin with. Um, and, and then I'll go, I'll highlight a, a few items of, of the, some, some of the results um, that, that I think might be interesting in the, in the vein of fostering discussion and dialogue, because uh, that's really the, the why I did this research to begin with. Um, and and then a couple of quick reflections on on, on where things are where things are headed. Um, so so this research for me really started as a as a as a guinea pig. Um, so I enrolled in a in a the first doctoral program for sustainability. At least that's the claim, and as far as I know, that's about right. Um, at the uh, School of Sustainability at Arizona State University. Uh, when it started in 2006, um, and and I was part of a first class of PhD students uh, to be a part of uh, that program, um, and and it was it was and remains I think a place where you know we're trying to hammer out what this sort of inter or transdisciplinary field looks like, what it means to get a PhD in that, what it means to do research or conduct science on sustainability. Um, and, and, you know, the students and the faculty uh, were discussing those questions and hammering that out through the curriculum. We were hammering that out in our initial uh, dissertations. Um, and so I decided to really uh, focus on that uh, uh, for, for my dissertation work, really a, a thinking about the question of, of how can science and technology inform and foster action for sustainability? Because we have this Global Institute of Sustainability ASU that houses the School of Sustainability, which is the education arm. What does this all mean? You know, what, how do we think the science that a university generates or the technology that a university or, or other members of society generate, uh, how is that going to move the needle uh, on, on sustainability? Um, and I was curious to explore you know, what sort of questions are scientists in this emerging uh, field of sustainability science asking? Um, how do they define sustainability, which is, you know, as, as I think we all know on this uh, call, uh, is a, you know, value-laden, contested terrain that involves uh, values around uh, ecological health and nature, values around uh, social equity, intergenerational equity, um, and these are all very sort of value, and into the future as well. Um, so value-laden, contested areas and and how is it that we can conduct science on that that will uh, inform action or will inform decision making and what so what does it look like and then by taking a sort of snapshot of of how this field was developing at the time when i'm doing my research it's really focusing on you know uh the a little bit of the history but certainly from 2006 to sort of 2012 when i was, was when i was really doing uh, a lot of work on this and so that's where many of my interviews and, and sort of the content I, I analyzed was, was, uh, was really coming on, on, online. Uh, but I think a lot of this stuff uh, st still, still holds. And then sort of given that, you know, given, this, given a snapshot of, of what sort of questions people are asking, what's emerging in the various institutions, you know, at the time there was the School of Sustainability, but then there was the University of Maine Sustainable Solutions Program, uh, Columbia Sustainable Development Program, uh, the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences had just established the Sustainability Science section. 
uh, a whole bunch of stuff, you know, in terms of the institutional uh, dimensions or, or trappings of any of any academic field that were rapidly emerging at that time and continue to do so uh, uh, to today. And so, as as we're trying to bring shape to this area, what what are some of the tensions, right? As 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 Ira put it in the introduction, what are some of the epistemic and normative issues with this that may inhibit or enhance the the ability of science to inform and foster action uh, for sustainability? Um, so in that way, it's almost in part a not quite as uh, not quite philosophical, but in a way trying to get some distance from what's going on to really reflect on 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 how the field is developing. Um, and how we might generate an open dialogue among scientists, uh, you know, uh, and educators on the call like this, uh, but also among decision makers in society to, to think about what the future of sustainability science might look like. Um, and so just a, just a quick, you know, recap of some of the history. The, the history goes back certainly further than 1999, uh, so certainly even further than the 87 Brundtland Report. Um, but in terms of the, uh, uh, the development of a thing called sustainability science, uh, our common journey, the national U.S. National Research Council report, uh, is the first time I think that you know, at least in a, a formal setting, uh, that there's a proposal for a sustainable field, a new field called sustainability science that should uh, inform the ability of decision makers and society uh, to trend to to transition towards sustainability. And this is followed, I think, by a number of influential publications, uh, including a 2001 piece in Science. Uh, for that, that really maps out an agenda for sustainability science, one that should seek to understand the fundamental character of interactions between nature and society and enhance society's capacity to guide those interactions along more sustainable trajectories. And so there's this real sense that, that and this emerges from, from other work going on uh, in, in ecology um, and, and geography and other fields at the time, where there's a feeling that there, there's a need for, as Jane Lubchenco put it in some publications, for, for a new social contract uh, for, for science and society. Um, that, that this idea that, that scientists can just go and do their own research and it'll somehow um, it, it, it end up benefiting society uh, doesn't quite cut it when you're talking about sustainability uh, challenges from climate change to overconsumption to the how our global economy operates to biodiversity loss that this really requires scientists to do more pointed um, what some have called use inspired research so not just thinking about you know what what Donald this is a, a graph that's been adapted by uh, from Donald uh, Donald Stokes's uh, uh, book Pastor's Quadrant looking at the sort of some of the bifurcations between basic and applied uh, uh, research um, and so there's a sense within sustainability science and some uh, larger trends uh, in scientific research that pure basic research disinterested in, in the potential social use of, of science and technology doesn't quite cut it, again, because of the, the rapid development of sustainability challenges. And so we need to, what, what William Clark and other sustainability scientists called for, we need to conduct use-inspired basic research. We have to really conduct research on societal problems uh, that can then uh, inform uh, decision makers um, and other stakeholders to make better, uh, more sustainable um, uh, decisions. Um, and so this is really the, 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 what I'm trying to, to figure out in the, in, in the book and in the, my research at the time is, is what does this research look like and how, how, is, this, how is this new field emerging and, and evolving? Um, and so Primarily, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about the details of, of this. It just helps summarize, you know, a couple of the a couple of the themes. Um, but I was really interested in, in in one: how are sustainability scientists actually defining sustainability? Um, uh, and 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 so I, I conducted interviews uh, toward that end. But I was also interested, you know, given those definitions of sustainability and how they were seeing uh, that, and how they were seeing sort of the normative or value orientation of their work. What what did they think were important? What did what did what were important research questions that they were pursuing? And they thought the field should pursue um, that could advance those values and and meet those challenges. And then finally, um, because this is another critical element uh, to the field uh, that that everybody was talking about at the time. This isn't just about as I said generating uh, knowledge, but it's about generating knowledge that needs to be linked to action. Um, and so. Um, you know, I don't, I think it's fair to say that, you know, n not all scientists are necessarily good at thinking about what the relationship between science and society or, or between knowledge and decision making is. And so what were 
the explicit and uh, or implicit ways that that sustainability scientists were thinking about the relationship between the knowledge they were generating uh, and the impact or, or use of that knowledge. Um, and so so I'm happy to, to you know, in, in questions uh, or, or whatever, uh, to, to, to talk more about, you know, how, how things were defined. In short, I did see this bifurcation toward, you know, your, the, the Brundtland definition, the sort of, you know, that it's about protecting life support systems and, 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 and generating, you know, the ability of, of, of life support systems to, to meet human needs now and into the future. That was what I would call the sort of universalist uh, definition of sustainability. Um, that sort of, you know, where, where scientists are, are outlining that definition, which is the sort of, you know, dominant definition at the time. Um, and, and that, you know, those are, that's a definition, those are values articulated by society that we're still do, conducting sort of value-free basic science or use-inspired science toward that end. Um, whereas, you know, other, other scientists were, were, were much more sort of Procedural, procedurally oriented in how they saw sustainability defined, much more contextual, you know, figured out in a place among a community which scientists may be a part of. Um, and, and then so the process of defining that and what it means is, is embedded in a place and or, or, or at a time. Um, and the research agendas, I think, you know, fall out underneath some of this. Uh, there's the one that, you know, similar to what I cited from Kate's that that's about uh, research on, on coupled human natural systems and the interaction between those systems. Um, that it's really, and there's fundamental questions about that, uh, but if we work with stakeholders as we do that, that research or co-produce that knowledge, uh, then, it'll, then it'll link to action. Um, and, and versus a more, a little bit more radical or, or what I would call social change oriented approach to, to the research, that it's much more action oriented and it's about how science and technology can, can really impact uh, the, the direction and speed of sustainability transitions. Um, and then finally, the, this idea of, okay, wh what are the embedded notions of linking knowledge to action? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and I, I think there's sort of two broad camps. The, the first I would call the knowledge, fist, uh, the knowledge first approach, <laughs> the knowledge fist approach, the knowledge first approach that, um, and this is from an article uh, by William Clark, uh, that you know, that certainly, yes, that there's a value-based component of this uh, uh, around sustainability and that sustainability is really about how we ought to use the, how we humans should use the earth. Um, but the only way to get to this goal uh, is to understand uh, the interactions between social and environmental systems. And so there's this embedded sense, I think, that, that the only way we can make better, more sustainable uh, decisions is first understanding basically what the problem is or what, what the dynamics are that are currently sort of unsustainability or maybe in some case, uh, unsustainable or maybe in certain cases are sustainable. And by better understanding those interactions, we can then make, uh, then we can then make decisions. So there is a sense that we need to sort of get a good understanding of things before we can really move forward. Um, and, and the way I would, sort of depict in a, sorry, if it's a little blurry, I'm just realizing now when it's fully expanded, so apologies for that. Um, but, but there's a sense that, that uh, you know, that, that sustainability, the goals and values around it are defined by society. Um, and that scientific knowledge, especially this core of, of, of this coupled systems research uh, done by scientists can inform, uh, can inform society through this process of knowledge co-production, where you're trying to figure out what knowledge is salient and how to build trust so that it's credible uh, and legitimate. Um, and this is a little bit different, I think. I, I mean, especially if you think about how the field is developing and what's being funded uh, in different places, you know, in, in general, I think the National Science Foundation in the US context tends to, fu to fund more of the, the first uh, uh, camp. Um, and, and a lot of the, there, there, certainly there's stuff in the US, but certainly in, in Europe and elsewhere, there's a lot more uh, funding that's going toward sustainability transitions or what I would call a more process oriented approach. One that where science plays a crucial role, this is a quote from an interview, um, but it doesn't tell us anything about where we want to be. That has to emerge from discussion uh, and scientists are a part of that, engage uh, different stakeholders, citizens, decision makers as part of a, of a collective. Um, and so it's a much more open process um, and much more overlap I think between where science is as a knowledge provider, so is society a knowledge provider. And scientists and, and 
um, stakeholders from society are participating in that process to hash out you know, what sort of knowledge is useful in given situations, what are our goals and what are our, our values. Um, and I think, you know, just to uh, 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 summarize a, a couple of issues, I go into more depth in the, in the book, but I think there's a couple that are interesting uh, to think about, especially uh, thinking about this discussion afterwards and, and, and how this stuff uh, works in terms of, you know, research and curriculum as well. Um, you know, I think there's, there's, there's a couple of really important tensions here. Uh, and the first is one that I would call the, the knowledge first trap, um, where there's, and I think it's, I sort of articulated it before with the knowledge first uh, 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 approach there, but, but I think there's this tendency that, you know, I think it's a good thing, right? That, that we understand that, that doing disinterested science just for curiosity's sake doesn't always match up with what the needs of society might be, especially when you're talking about such pressing problems. Um, and so let's generate knowledge that, that is more directed at that problem. That's a great step. But then I think we often fall in this trap. Well, we need to get a better understanding before we can finally act. Um, and I think the worst case scenario is where you end up where, you know, where, where climate change has been for the last 30 years, where there's obviously some uncertainty there. And, and so there's all sort of everybody is bought into like, oh, well, let's do more research. Let's do more research. It becomes in a, the hoped for finally holy grail for action once we finally sort of get it to a certain point. But then it also becomes an excuse for others who maybe don't want to act to say, okay, we have to just know more. And so you throw more money at climate science uh, to, to, to get a better and better understanding. And so there's this assumption that advancing societal action for sustainable outcomes requires the production of more knowledge. Um, and I argue in the book, and you know, I would argue that that, that may be the case in some specific situations. Um, certainly, I'm not saying that science is useless, but I think there are a lot of situations uh, in which knowledge is not even close to the sort of primary limiting factor on our ability to, to, to take better, more sustainable actions. Um, it could be issues of, of technology. Obviously, it could be issues of politics, uh, policy mechanisms, uh, you name it. Um, and and there, you know, th that we should, uh, as sustainability scientists, and I'll come back to this later, you know, also do research on, on different sort of problem categories and, and decision-making structures to understand where is it that knowledge may be a limiting factor. Okay, great. If it is, let's get, let's generate more knowledge on, on that so we, so we can fill that gap. But let's also understand what the difference between that sort of problem is and others where, where that is not going to be the limiting factor. Um, and then I think related to this, uh, there, uh, there's, a, there's an issue of, of scientizing uh, sustainability, and that's uh, borrowing from an from, uh, article from Dan Sarowitz, uh, where appeals to scientific arguments act as proxies for what are really debates about values and politics. And again, I think you could see that happening with climate change, uh, but also a number uh, of other uh, issues where, where, where it becomes a case of, of dueling science. Um, and as we know, you know, there's enough uncertainty and, and nature and especially human nature interactions are, are varied enough. Uh, that you that it's probably not that difficult to find an opposing scientific viewpoint uh, to 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 mask your your for sort of value or political uh, standpoint. And I think when it comes to sustainability, to sustainability, not that science is a you know science can be a useful voice in that, um, but but that we have to be clear about sort of where are we talking about values and politics and and the sort of normative dimension of where we want to go, um, and and when are we when are we talking about um, uh, you know, sort of more, some more empirical issues about, you know, where we are, what some specific problem or trade-offs might be. And I think we can, you know, when you get into this valuating terrain, it, bec it, bec it becomes uh, difficult to, to sort out uh, what we're really talking about. And so just to be careful about that. And so um, uh, reflect, reflecting on this, um, in, in the book, I, I end up, and I won't get into, the, into detail on this here, um, but, but I think, you know, what doing this, I, I sort of, you know, and probably as a graduate student reading too much Walter Benjamin, but, uh, but I still think it's a useful a analogy here. Uh, but there's this case of the, the, you know, when Walter Benjamin looks at the Angelus Novus uh, uh, by Paul Klee, which you see up on the screen here, um, and he, he sees this as, as humanity looking back on the, you know, destruction of the 20th century, um, and, and uh, we, you know, with terror and sort of just backing into the future. Um, and I think, you know, the, 
that as sustainability scientists um, with our, our sort of, you know, weapon of choice is to go like, okay, if there's a problem, let's do more research on it and generate more knowledge about that problem so we can make better decisions. We'd have that sort of rational uh, uh, understanding of the link between knowledge and action. Um, uh, but, but what really, I think what I'm struck with here is that, you know, just like this, this, this angel that we're looking back on all the problems we created and trying to understand it. Meanwhile, our, our, our back, you know, is, 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 is facing the future and we're not really looking over our shoulders to figure out where we want to go. Um, and so in the, in the book, I propose this idea of a, of a design science for sustainability that is more explicitly anticipatory, is more explicitly future oriented, um, not denigrating the need to, to understand how we got here and, and what our problems are, uh, but really trying to figure out if, if these are normative issues of where we want to be you know, how do we best flesh out the, that pathway collectively? And so with some co-authors, uh, we, we put together a paper on the future of sustainability science. Um, and you can see the idea of, of, you know, creating and pursuing desirable futures um, and exploring and fostering uh, socio-technical change as two of those key elements, uh, in addition to mapping sustainability, sustainability values and enabling a social and institutional learning for, for sustainable development. Um, uh, and what I haven't gone back to do is sort of, you know, this paper has been cited a number of times, um, and I do think it might be an interesting time to go back and, and sort of look at to what degree has the landscape uh, uh, changed over over the past, uh, you know, well, it's been only a couple of years since the book, but, you know, maybe, since, you know, three to five years, because um, I think there, there have been a lot of changes and there's been a lot more variation in how things are being pursued. Um, but I still think there's, and that in addition to that, I would also add, you know, some three, I think, core points, which I'd love to discuss more. Um, but but I, I'm really interested to, and this is where some of my work is now, um, you know, what is the link between advances in knowledge on coupled human natural systems, for example, but also advances in methods, advances in engagement practices, advances in the organizational capacity and structure around sustainability education and sustainability science? And what is the link between that and more sustainable outcomes? Uh, how do we actually interrogate that link? Um, and, and I think, and this is, you know, part of why I did the, did this dissertation to begin with. And part of why I wrote the book the way I did is more venues. And this is a great, a great example, but more venues and, and opportunity for dialogues and reflections on where the field is headed. Um, but also on the implicit models of social and, and technological change that's embedded, uh, in sustainability research and education. Um, I don't know that it's always made explicit. Um, and you know, but yet that is essentially what we're talking about that we need social and technological change for a better future and so how do we think those things actually change um, not just generating knowledge uh, about unsustainability but how do we actually understand that change and how to affect it um, and and finally you know and this is certainly nothing new uh, this goes uh, uh, back to, to to work on post-normal science if not uh, further uh, but how do we stretch the institutional limits of the university? Um, because there, I think there are, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, assistant professors and others have to still publish a certain amount of things and get and get money from the National Science Foundation. Um, I think there's much more flexibility on the curriculum and education end. Um, uh, but there are still some institutional barriers with how we direct research. And also the, you know, there are some barriers, although I think there's a lot of innovation on the, the relationship between the university uh, and research and, and, the, and the community. Uh, but I think there's a lot of great stuff happening there uh, that, that we could probably integrate more effectively into what the National Science Foundation likes to fund and what's being published in some of the, some of the more primary journals, for example. Um, and so uh, thank you. I think that was a, you know, I was trying to get around 20 minutes. That looks about right. Um, and, and so I look forward to the discussion. And, uh, and, you know, if we don't, I'm happy to take any emails or anything like that as well, because it's sort of a mystery to me who's on this call. So I'd welcome uh, any further dialogue as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Thad, for that fascinating presentation. I think uh, that the clear distinctions and other nuances that you uh, raised here in this presentation uh, may not have been encountered before by uh, many sustainability experts and scholars, and I can certainly see the implications for practitioners and policymakers. 
of course, on, on this call, uh, where our target audience is uh, teaching faculty, uh, what I'd like to get around to is uh, take away lessons learned for um, curriculum and faculty development. But uh, I did receive an, a number of questions and comments through the chat box. I'm also receiving emails from folks uh, who use the call in by phone option. And so let me try to group uh, the comments and questions as neatly as possible into um, a, a small handful uh, so we can manage our time. Um, I guess one um, set of questions and comments have to do with um, social science uh, factors in the mix. When you talk about sustainability science, do you uh, consider social science factors in the mix? And similarly, um, how could sustainability science claim to be transdisciplinary when, uh, to the best of this questioner's knowledge, it doesn't involve the arts, much of social science philosophy, much of the criticism about the role of science and the promotion of emotions. So you may disagree with some of the assumptions in there, Thad, but I, I throw that out to you as the first question. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And as a sort of interdisciplinary social scientist, I certainly empathize with it. Um, and, you know, I think what I was trying to do with with the with this work is really focus on who is sort of self identifying uh, and sort of, um, for lack of a better word, self consciously trying to build a new thing called sustainability science and how is that new thing then, you know, generated and, and, and become real, oops, become real through through journals, through uh, uh, research and education institutions. Uh, through things like the National Academies of Sciences Sustainability Science uh, Initiative. Um, and so I, I was trying to focus on some of those organizational and institutional elements um, to get a sense of, you know, where, you know, where some of that, you know, I guess power is. And if, if we want to get in social scientists to science, where is that, where that, where is that power? Where is that funding? You know, how is it being um, shaped at the National Research Council, at the National Academies, um, at the National Science Foundation? And so I think when you look along the, some of those uh, institutions, it's really heavily uh, uh, natural science. But there's some there's some other social science in um, uh, there, uh, but certainly not some of the issues that the questioner uh, brought up. Um, but I think when you look at, um, you know, I didn't really do this. I didn't really look along geographic lines, but I, cert I certainly think in, in the European context, if you look at a lot of the work on sustainability transitions, uh, there's a lot more uh, social science involvement. Uh, but then I, I think over the last, you know, five plus years, uh, there, there's, been a, there's been a lot more, you know, more journals, uh, uh, more, you know, the emergence of more, um, you know, academic institutions at universities that are sustainability programs um, and curriculum. And so I certainly think that's part of the, the mix. And 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 that's you know sort of at the end of the book, I try to flesh more of that out. And and in the future of sustainability science article, we don't call out the arts necessarily, but um, but I think that that uh, that you know if you want to call yourself a sustainability science, I don't think you need approval. So um, so that's you know I I I think it ought to be part of the mix. But then the problem is, how do you really generate a, a transdisciplinary conversation on that? Um, because I don't think it always is. Uh, uh, these communities are always in 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 conversation with one another. Thank you, Thad. Um, I was fascinated by your reference during Hello, the presentation to um, the distinction between uh, U.S.-based uh, researchers and uh, European researchers. You again just referenced the. Uh, sustainability transitions theme that's prevalent in Europe. I want to link that to some other comments we had here about uh, what resources teaching faculty might have at their disposal to better grasp sustainability science, of course, other than your own book. And uh, <laughs> the, um, in my own uh, review of sustainability science, I certainly noticed and have raised with you in our prep call the cadre of people uh, who uh, are based within the National Academy of Science and the uh, proceedings um, 
segment that's labeled sustainability science. But when you look at the uh, journals, uh, the, the editorial boards uh, show a preponderance of uh, international uh, affiliations. And uh, if you would like to comment further on how you see that uh, playing out, that's great. But also, I wanted to ask you um, if you had any specific suggestions, as some have asked here, for uh, following up on um, uh, resources that might help uh, develop curriculum. Great. Yeah. Um, so one, I mean, despite some of the issues, the National Academies of Science, um, it is the uh, Science and Technology for Sustainability program. They do have a lot of material on that. They have a sort of library of sustainability related material. Um, and then there's a uh, another website uh, called, I forget the organization that, that curates it. Um, hold on, I just lost. LearningforSustainability.net uh, um, is, I think, especially useful for uh, for for you know educators and those putting together a curriculum. Um, and uh, I think those are those are two that jump out to me in terms of you know they just have a wealth of of material and they're sort of well organized and 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 well curated. Thanks, Dad. Uh, before, before we uh, shift over to Vanessa, let me uh, ask you another uh, basic question. You uh, mentioned in one of your closing slides the focus of your current research. I would invite you to say a little bit more about that. But also, again, since, uh, our audience is primarily teaching faculty. Uh, are you currently teaching courses, and to what extent do you utilize the concept uh, construct in uh, in teaching. Yeah. Um, so so yes, I am teaching right now, and and part of my uh, you know you may have been in, I didn't mention this explicitly, but one of my legs is in the in in science and technology studies. Um, so how can we sort of both understand and and help shape uh, socio technical systems? Um, and, and so you, you you see that pop up there. Um, and so in, I'm in the school for the future of innovation in society, which, you know, ASU is one of those places that we have a school of sustainability, but also every other school is this weird interdisciplinary thing. Um, and but, you know, sustain, a lot of us in, in here do, do sustainability related work. But from the perspective of, of how do you, uh, you know, that technology is more important than maybe uh, sustainability uh, discourse might traditionally give it credit. And so how do we really understand how to, how to shape technology and uh, including, you know, urban infrastructures in new and different ways. And so I'm doing a lot of work on urban resilience uh, in that large project and, and, and how, we, how we basically, you know, transition from unsustainable or, or vulnerable states into, into more sustainable and resilient. Um, and I'm also teaching a workshop course right now with a bunch of undergraduates where we're working with the city to generate scenarios for autonomous vehicles. Because every day on the way to work, I see at least 10 autonomous vehicles on the road in Tempe. Because uh, we have Uber here that doing their thing. We have Waymo, which is the Google outfit. And then we also have Intel driving around on the street. But there is zero discussion of what does that mean for CO2 emissions or for livability or for safety. Um, and so we're working with the city on, you know, basically how do you bring sustainability thinking, but also how do you bring sort of future oriented thinking uh, to, to understanding and, and planning for autonomous vehicles. Um, so that's just a couple of examples. Well, I appreciate that. I think we're picking up some background noise on over yeah, Ira, sorry that the background noise isn't me because I just had myself muted so just uh, just uh, if that's useful yeah. okay. we will ask then everyone who's on the line if you're not you should be okay um, and uh, Thad I know that uh, at the top of the hour you're going to have to leave us so let me offer our collective thanks now for joining us on this webinar. Uh, and with that, I'm going to change the presenter role over to Vanessa and 
Also, I remind everyone before we totally leave that his nice offer to field follow-up uh, questions from anyone in attendance. So, Vanessa, if you can accept the presenter role, you should see a box coming up, and there it is. And the floor is yours, Vanessa. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Let me go into my slideshow mode. So, do you still see it? Do you see just the... Um, let me change this around so you don't have to see everything that I'm doing. Uh, let's see if I remember how to do this. Oh, I did this earlier. How do I switch over? Nope. Hold on. Sorry. There you go. That's fine. Well, thank you everyone for sticking around for um, my section of the webinar today. I'll be focused um, really drilling down on one specific uh, example of trying to create a course around uh, sustainability at the University of Minnesota, where I am based. Um, so um, let me just give a tiny bit of context of where I am and where this course is kind of fitting into other efforts. Um, we at the University of New Hampshire have something um, called the Sustainability Institute that's been around for about 20 years that's focused on promoting sustainability through education, research, and practice or and operations. Um, they've done a lot of amazing things and most recently uh, applied and achieved the platinum rating with stars. Uh, I'm not going to focus on the Sustainability Institute, but I just wanted to provide it as the larger context. Um, what I'm doing is actually not within the Sustainability Institute, separate from them, um, although they're a part of it and supporter of it. So there is also a general effort to incorporate sustainability education across the campus at UNH. Uh, there are programs such as gastronomy, sustainable agriculture. Most recently, there were funds to support faculty across the campus to integrate sustainability into their disciplinary courses. Um, and again, you can look up the UNH Sustainability Institute online uh, to get more information about that sustainability across the curriculum effort. And then what I'm going to focus on today is my work within the sustainability dual major. This, this major was about five years in the making and just launched in spring of 2016. So this is the fourth semester right now of having the sustainability dual major on board at UNH. And I was brought on um, at the launch of this program. So um, I'm fairly new to UNH as well. So the sustainability dual major is open to students from across the university. Uh, they can be in any college, um, but it must be paired with the student's primary major. They can't major only in sustainability. This is a nod to the idea that um, sustainability is best achieved through depth in a particular field and breadth across an ability to work interdisciplinarily. For students, who want to have a sustainability dual major, they have to take three core courses in sustainability, and I'm the one who teaches four courses. Uh, it's an introductory level sustainability class that's probably familiar to many of you. Uh, in addition to that introductory class, there is this mid-level sustainability methods class, as well as a senior capstone. And the students also have to take five electives from courses in departments across campus. These are courses that have been approved to be electives. Um, and and that, that makes up the dual major. And obviously, today I'm focused on the methods class. I just wanted to provide those couple slides of background so you knew where this fit in. So you could see that this is a new program. and. Um, this sustainability methods class I taught uh, last spring, and I'm teaching it right now this fall for the second time, and it will be offered every fall from now on. 
So when I got on board to uh, get this sustainability dual major off the ground, really the only guidance I had was an original proposal for the dual major, as well as a committee of faculty from across the university who oversee the dual major who meet a couple times a semester. So what I was told for the sustainability methods class is that this, there are a couple learning objectives and that the students could learn sustainability science, history, goals, and framework. This is kind of the stuff that that Thad just walked us through. And that students should learn the complexities of stakeholder driven, solutions oriented, coupled human and natural systems research and collaboration. <laughs> so um, I was left with how to do this, um, which is pretty awesome and exciting and um, empowering, but also, as you can imagine, a little overwhelming. But um, what I drew from, from this little bit of guidance was that I was going to teach sustainability science process. So I come more from that process-oriented approach that that has talked about. And I, I took it on to have um, this course be about the language, concepts, and practice of conducting transdisciplinary research. The students would not be learning discipline-specific methods of approaching sustainability. It would not be teaching ecological field methods or uh, survey design or, um, or you know, anything that's discipline-specific. I was going to focus on the process of sustainability science, which is great. I was personally immersed in that literature from my doctoral research, as well as my current research, which focuses a lot on the knowledge to action link. Uh, so I was excited about this. I just needed to find the resources for teaching it to undergrads and the structure for doing so. Uh, and that's where I hit a wall. I started looking for these mid-level undergrad resources textbooks, books, films, anything I could find. And besides for a couple pieces here and there, there was not much. That left me with having to teach a course drawing primarily on academic articles and chapters from books that are often much too advanced for these students. They use language and terminology unfamiliar to students. Even the description of the concepts were using concepts that were above their heads. And um, that, that was a huge challenge. So I had to figure out how, how to help provide them a little bit of scaffolding uh, uh, in the concepts. Vanessa, as uh, you go to your next slide, uh, the participants are asking if you could move your GoToMeeting control panel uh, a little bit over to the right. It is overlapping the right side of your slides. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me know. All right, that should be better. All right, so this um, course, I decided to organize it using the three phases of transdisciplinary research. And for those of you who are familiar with sustainability science, this is going to this is going to be something that you know, but for those of you who are new to this, um, I'll just really, really briefly talk about that. Um, transdisciplinary research or this working with academic and non-academic partners to find solutions to sustainability issues can follow a sort of a three-phase process in which first you create your collaborative team and define the problem that you're focused on then work to co-produce knowledge to address that problem, using your solutions and the fact that you're going to find, look for solutions in mind. And then lastly, you link your knowledge to your action. And I decided to use these two phases again to create a scaffolding for the students to hold on to, to provide more substance to many of the abstract ideas within sustainability science. And I should say, for those of you who are familiar with this literature, that I recognize that this framework is not appropriate for all sustainability efforts. And um, it, it, it is much more of an iterative, continuous process. But um, it helps, it, I think, I, I, my, my, my hypothesis is that having this simplicity would, would help the students as we move through the course. 
and as actually as I get into the second half of this class, I, I'm bringing up those kind of strengths uh, as as appropriate. All right, so how let me get get into this how I'm, I'm organizing this class a little bit more. We started out the course with an intro to sustainability science kind of to address that first learning objective I was given the history and goals and framework of sustainability science. Um, and in doing that, I also compared or provided the students ability to compare sustainability science to traditional modes of research. I wanted to shine a light on the fact that there are different types of knowledge and different ways of gathering information. Um, because without that comparison, students have a difficult time understanding why sustainability science is a unique way of approaching, of approaching complex problems. And I'm going back to that comparison throughout the course. A lot of students aren't hadn't ever really thought about this before. So then we spent a few weeks on topics that I grouped into the first phase of transdisciplinary research of building a team and identifying what your problems are. Um, these were topics such as interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, collaboration. Uh, who, who, what are stakeholders or partners? How do you identify their values and value different types of knowledges? Um, again, as a reminder, I'll talk about my teaching approach in a moment, but for now, uh, let me just say that the students are mostly reading journal articles and book chapters to try to get at these concepts, to try to understand them. I'm now, you know, kind of halfway through the course and we're in topics related to knowledge co-production. So I, you know, we did an overview on what that even means. How does that compare to the, a loading dock approach? How do those different um, the diagrams that Thad provided about how, how uh, knowledge production can work in sustainability science? Talk a lot about boundary work and the different concepts surrounding boundary work. Um, I also include a few courses about uh, that are systems analysis methods. This is kind of the most methodological part of the class in the traditional sense. And this kind of goes more to that uh, knowledge first approach that Thad talked about. So in recognition that some students will come from an orientation where they are mostly interested in systems analysis, we do focus a little bit on, on a couple of those methods such as GIS or life cycle sustainability analyses. And for some students, like I had an engineering student who just got so jazzed when we talked about this stuff. So, so I, I do put it in there for that purpose. And I also included uh, a course on the potential role of citizen science in the co-production of knowledge. I should say that for, for several of these topics, I either have guest speakers or, you know, we went to the GIS lab or I draw on a cooperative extension to do a really awesome citizen science field day, um, so I can use others to help fill in my own personal gaps of knowledge for some of these things. And then I'll end the class with a couple um, sessions on knowledge to action. So what is action? How, how do we develop solutions to these grand challenges? And just tying the pieces together from the semester and talking about how all of these phases are actually quite iterative. So that is the content of the course, but like I said, I also want to talk touch on what my teaching approach is, because my goal was to mirror sustainability science and how I even taught this course. So I'll give a few examples of that. So for one, I um, recognize that sustainability science is place-based or context-based. And um, in that vein, I uh, organized four half-day field trips for the students that focus on different case studies that are related to sustainability. And there'll be um, what were project partners on those different projects uh, helping to lead and provide information uh, each of those, at, at each of those case study field trips. And then the students analyze them in respect to the content we're learning in blog posts. So each student has created a WordPress blog and they um, submit their reflections and their analysis of the case studies in relation to our class on those blogs. 
So the next aspect of sustainability science that I tried to reflect is interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. The students are working in, in uh, groups on semester long projects and the groups are made up of students from different majors. So in this semester, I have 15 students in this class, some environmental science, school of business, community planning, environmental and resource economics, journalism, social work, marine biology, women's studies, and recreation management. So it provides this rich classroom laboratory for doing collaborative work with people who have not only different knowledge, but different ways of viewing what's important in the world. And, and they don't even realize that yet when they come to the class. So it's kind of fun to lead them in this process. Well, it's fun for me. I'm not sure yet how fun it is for them. They're starting to uh, reach some of those uh, struggles that all collaborative teams have, you know, struggling to find times when everyone can meet. Uh, it's the fact that it's taking longer for them to get work done than when they just do it by themselves. They have different ideas on how to move forward. Uh, but anyhow, for me, it's a great teaching opportunity. Uh, and then I'm also focused on the solutions driven aspect of sustainability science. So the main project that I just referred to, this semester long project, is to create a sustainability methods reader. Uh, this is the solution to the problem that I don't have the resources with which to teach this class. But it's just, this, that, this reader is also, is also going to be open educational research. That's what the OER is. And for those of you who aren't familiar with open educational resources, there are materials, um, all sorts of materials in this particular research, that have the Creative Commons copyright that allows for free use, reproduction, and revision uh, with citation. Um, and OER uh, meets many sustainability goals, uh, social justice goals. Uh, textbooks are notoriously rising in cost faster than the rate of inflation. Uh, and there are many studies now that are showing how students are not taking courses because of textbook costs or are not buying the text and trying to learn as much as they can without them or foregoing other needs of theirs in order to buy texts. So um, having many social justice goals as well as environmental goals and the fact that we are not uh, printing and shipping textbooks. So um, and it also potentially, like I said, could help me uh, because it's something that I'm going to be able to use and keep building on for the next several years in this course. And hopefully it will be something that's available for others to use and to be and to edit to be made place specific and focused as needed. And this is part of my larger open pedagogy approach to teaching. Um, and without getting into that too much, um, I, I'm approaching this class that we are all learners in it, including myself. So we all have ideas and experiences to contribute. The students um, tell me what they need as well. For example, they just wanted, they just asked me for an extra attempt at doing their outlines for their chapters and if I would be willing to provide uh, feedback in and a revised grade <laughs> for their first outlines. And yeah, if that's what they need, I'll do it. Um, there's no throwaway assignments in this class. So those blog posts are part of this concept that instead of creating papers that they write and I read and then nothing else happens with them, they're doing blog posts that will become part of their e-portfolios that they have to create in their senior capstones. And those e-portfolios can be used potentially when they're applying to grad schools or to jobs or even just to share with family or friends who are interested in what they do. And obviously, this is the reader itself is um, not a throwaway assignment, but something that will 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 have a life after this class. Uh, and that that reader just to provide a tiny bit more information. Um, it's again, it's the group project, and every group is writing two chapters, and they have assignments throughout the course that are guiding them from their outlines to drafts to peer review. And um, at UNH, we. Uh, uh, we use Canvas as our platform, and within that, and within our course site, I can create different groups, and each group has their own sort of sub-site where they can have their own um, announcements or files that they post or discussions, and they have access to Office 365, which is similar to Google Docs, so they can create documents 
um, they can create documents that they all work on. I grade right in these documents. I provide comments to them that they all can see uh, and so forth. So that, that's helped a lot. So I'm at the eight week mark now of this class, the first time trying to do, do the class in this way. And you know, I'll just tell you my reflections at the moment. Um, who knows what I'll think in, at the end of the semester or next year, but, but you get where, where I'm at now. Uh, so one is that these concepts that we're going over, these sustainability science concepts, sub stakeholder driven, place based, solution oriented, inspired research, these concepts are so difficult for the students, way more than I expected. They're really abstract and unexpected. The students, I don't think, have any idea what they're getting into when they start this class. Uh, many of them are coming into this class with such a um, a uh, minimal idea of how the world works, that there are even different sectors in society that care about different things and that approach problems differently, that government exists at different scales and that local government and federal government don't always work well together, that science isn't the only way of knowing. Like, I, I swear I can see smoke coming out of their heads in class as they try to grapple with some of these ideas. And then not having educational resources at their level compounds this difficulty. So I think that using the three phases of transdisciplinary research as a scaffolding has been helpful. Interestingly, even though it's a simple concept, it's taken, it took about a third of the semester for students to kind of get it, to kind of get that there are these three phases of working together, and who I even mean is working together and what they're trying to do. But by having that framework that I mentioned many times in every class, it's gotten reinforced over and over. And if nothing else, I think students will remember the three phases of transdisciplinary research. And I do think it's providing a framework with which they can understand the other concepts we're covering. But it's working because I have those field trips. So the field trips are what are making the concepts real and tangible. So every time we talk about something, we relate it back to the field trip. So, you know, in such and such field trip, they identify stakeholders and how did they get to know their value? Did they have a method of co-production co of knowledge? If so, what did it look like? You know, so we, those field trips themselves have become boundary objects in our class by which we can understand and make sense of the material we're covering. So, Despite that, I have no idea if I'm setting them up for failure with this reader. Will they be able to understand enough to write a first draft of a reader? And how do I grade this thing? I am someone who loves rubrics, but the rubrics I could create for this have to be very general by the fact that they're all writing such different topics and because I'm doing an open pedagogy approach that allows them a lot more control in the direction they take this. The good thing is that I teach all these three courses, core courses, so I've had these students before, I have a relationship with them, and I have a very open and honest approach to teaching. So I have told them that this is an experiment, and so far they haven't rebelled, at least not yet. Uh, so I'm taking it and running with it. I have no idea if we'll be able to use this reader, and I'm kind of worried about what might happen if it is really far from being used, and how I, how I talk about that as we but um, it's exciting anyhow, and it might take a bunch of years, but um, we'll see where it goes. So I know a lot of you have um, have experience, I'm sure, I, I, like that. I would really love to know who else is on this call, and um, I would love suggestions you have, resources you have, ways you've done this. Uh, I bet other people are teaching this. I just couldn't find examples of it, so I'd love to know what others are doing. And I'm again, more than willing to uh, answer other questions, share my syllabi to me. Um, obviously, I'm taking an open pedagogy approach. I believe sharing and uh, learning from each other. So thank you. And thank you, Vanessa. That was excellent. Uh, and we have a number of questions and comments that have come in. Um, what I would add here at this point is um, that that yes, you will get a list of uh, those who were attendees on uh, this webinar. And our approach with the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium is if uh, there is sufficient interest for a deeper dive, 
that's when we set up our online cohorts for a uh, more interactive uh, discussion. So there have been questions in the chat box uh, about the opportunity for more interactivity, and that's how we uh, do it. Um, but f questions for today relating to this webinar, um, uh, a number of fairly basic, uh, almost short answer questions uh, for Vanessa. Uh, the level of the students in the class, freshmen or further along in the program, uh, a request for you to identify the base platform uh, that you showed on your screen, which was quite fascinating. And um, also from earlier on in your presentation, recognizing that uh, different folks have different ways of defining transdisciplinary uh, maybe you can uh, take another shot at addressing your definition of transdisciplinary. Uh, sure. So, level of students, uh, of sophomores, all of these students had to uh, Hang on one second. Uh, everyone, I have tried to mute everyone on the line, but apparently someone's got some background noise, and I really have to ask you. Uh, to hold down the noise so we all can hear. Thank you. Uh, sure. So these students all, uh, no, there are no freshmen, but right now it is sophomores through seniors. Uh, because this program is still new and students are kind of cycling through it as they can, um, I do have some seniors in it. In the future, I think this will be a, a, a sophomore junior level class. Uh, the base platform is our UNH uses Canvas. We migrated from Blackboard last year um, and now use Canvas. Uh, I think that's what that question was about. Is, is that what, what I was being asked? Yes, I believe so. Okay, so that's not a decision that I made. That's that's a decision that UNH made and that we use just for our regular course uh, correspondence. Um, I debated using Google Docs for their collaborative work on the reader, but because uh, we could use from Microsoft 365 within Canvas and not need separate email addresses and that I could have access through it as the instructor. I went with Zoe, I went with that. A little bit of kickback from some students who are used to using Google Docs and one group who actually still is using Google Docs, they refused to use my, uh, my suggestion, but I'm letting them, I'm letting them do what they want to do. Uh, transdisciplinary research, sure, there's many conceptions of it and we actually talk about those conceptualizations in the class, most generally the definition I'm using or the description I'm using is a process in which academic researchers work with non-academic partners to address sustainability challenges in an effort to find solutions. So that's my one sentence description, if that helps. Thanks. Uh, we also had some requests for you to go back and talk about your dual sustainability major. For example, um, how many courses or credits are in there and uh, how is it distinct from the requirements for the disciplinary major that it's coupled to? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am not going to be able to accurately off the top of my head tell you how many credit students need for their primary major. I apologize for that. I, I forget right now. It's more than they need for the dual major. For the dual major, they need to take, well, we, our classes are worth four credits, not three at UNH. So I'm not actually going to tell you credit numbers. I'll just tell you course, like full courses. They need to have three core courses for the dual major, the intro course, the methods course, and a capstone course. And then they have to take five electives. Those are four credit, you know, for, for those electives are each four credits, as are the core courses. Um, and those electives are from uh, the departments across campus. So that is in addition to their primary major. They can double count two courses for both their primary major and the dual major. Again, that's a UNH regulation uh, for students who are doing dual majors or double majors. So let's say in uh, environmental engineering student is a dual major in sustainability. There are there are a few environmental engineering classes that are approved electives for the dual major, so they can count two of them towards their primary major and their dual major. And I uh, again for.
further clarification on this point, the question is, are the electives specific to sustainability across other departments, or uh, it may be, are there electives specific to sustainability across other departments? Yeah, we have a, a list of living objectives and, and, and that we want our electives to meet at least one of those living objectives and faculty apply to have their courses be approved as an elective and those learning objectives are everything from including specific social, environmental, or economic sustainability concepts to more of the process-oriented aspects of sustainability, such as working in interdisciplinary teams. So um, if people are interested and there's a way to do it, I could share the, that set of learning objectives that electives must meet in order to be uh, approved. Very good. And you, um, you and I, Vanessa, can discuss the best way to, to disseminate those uh, learning objectives if you're willing. Uh, I'm also seeing here uh, one helpful hint that's come in on the notion of what a successful final paper could include. Um, one attendee is saying that uh, she's been trying that a bit in her own open pedagogy courses that the the students themselves could get could. Uh, provide input on defining what a successful final paper should include. Yeah, I should say that I actually have led um, exercises with the class for each of their, like, so for the blog post where we worked together to come up with how they should be graded. And for the outlines, we did the same thing. So I have incorporated their own input as to how to grade uh, the products that they are doing. Uh, it's, it's a process of letting go for me, which is really interesting. So thank you for that from whoever suggested that. Also, here's a question that actually I wanted to ask Thad and uh, would have would want to ask you as well. Um, given the notoriety and significance of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, is uh, that something you explicitly reference in your course or uh, is that too helpful or too diffuse uh, from the questioner? Um, so in my introductory class, we talk about like what is sustainability and what are the different ways of sustainability. We talk about the sustainability goals. We don't explicitly cover that in this method class. If you have suggestions on ways that it could integrate into this process aspect of sustainability, I'd be more than I would love to hear that. Okay, well, that is something we could get into in a follow-up uh, cohort. Uh, again, something you and I, Vanessa, can discuss. Uh, there are other follow-up questions here uh, that have come in for Thad or relating to Thad's presentation. Um, I do not have at hand exactly the uh, two references that Thad mentioned, uh, but uh, the... Um, video transcript, the video recording of this presentation will be posted in the next day or so, and uh, we can all go back uh, into the presentation and double check uh, that. And I can tell you, we will post those references in the resources section of the SEC website. Um, I'm not seeing further questions at this point uh, for Vanessa. So I think, Vanessa, if you would like to um, say any closing thoughts, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Um, and before I do, uh, the always helpful Linda Urban has uh, provided the two citations, and uh, this may or may not be the two citations that uh, uh, the, the gentleman was looking for, uh, Thad Simon Miller, 2015, and Sarowitz, 1996. Uh, earlier, the seminal paper of Clark from 2010. Uh, but I think there were other references that later in the call uh, Thad mentioned as well. So I will post those on the website. So turning it back over to you, Vanessa. I don't think I have anything other than to thank everyone, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Very good. Uh, and I want to thank you, Vanessa, uh, not only for your presentation today, 
but also coming out of your participation in the SEC faculty conference. That was the genesis, your comments there, uh, that was the genesis of this particular webinar. Everyone uh, who participates in SEC activities is invited to identify their biggest challenges, their greatest needs, and what will result would be some SEC activity to try to address those needs. And uh, with that, uh, I want to thank all the uh, attendees also for your participation via the, um, the chat box. And uh, we are going to now sign off for today. Thank you all. Bye-bye.